The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Reinforcing the Bridge to HCT in AML, Clinical Conversations on Augmenting Efficacy with Innovative Options as Pre-Transplant and Maintenance Strategies. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash AJC860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. I'm Sergio Geralt. I'm the Deputy Division Head of Human Malignancy at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center and a Professor of Medicine at Weill Cornell Medical College. I'm glad to be joined by Brittany Nick Ragon from the Levine Cancer Center. And today we'll be talking to you about reinforcing the bridge to HCT and AML, clinical conversations on augmenting efficacy with innovative options as pre-treat transplant and maintenance strategies. So let me start by reminding you what we call is our current challenge at this time. At any given moment in the United States, 5,000 patients are diagnosed with newly, newly diagnosed AML and almost 1,000 of them have relapsed refractory. However, within this study period, only four out of 10 patients and uh, four out of 10 patients and three out of 10 patients actually didn't get treatment for AML. And we'll talk even more about the patients who did not get definitive treatment for AML. So the reality is, is that we as a leukemia community recognize that there is a significant underserving of our leukemia patients in regards to whether they should be treated or not, particularly when there is already good data to suggest that even in older patients, treatment does provide a survival advantage over supportive care. So when we talk about curative intent, when meaning transplant, there is a eightfold increased chance of not getting transplanted if you're 60 year olds or above, or if you receive your care in a non-academic center. And this is again, in addition to the other barriers to transplant, which include African-American and having no insurance coverage. We do know that physician bias is a major barrier to early referral. And part of the problem is, is that when interviewed, physicians have actually still, many of them, think that there is no role for transplant for older patients. When we know that with the advent of reduced intensity condition regimens and with the advent of post-transplant cyclophosphamide, one, we can transplant older and more frail patients, and two, everybody has a donor. How can we impact this? This was the SWOG study that actually looked at what we would call an early intervention in which all patients with newly diagnosed acute leukemia would have samples taken for HLA typing, and the National Marrow Donor Program would immediately do a rapid donor search and advise the provider whether the donor was available or not. And in that situation, almost 70% of patients were able to take to transplant. And obviously, patients who were taken to transplant were rapidly, were more likely to be in transmission and did significantly better. Dr. Boglarka Yogurts at Memorial Stone Kettering did a similar study, which we call the Leukemia Registration Trial. And in that study, again, by the simple act of asking for a transplant consultation at the time of remission induction, we were able to take to transplant more than 60% of the patients. And the main barrier to transplant was not actually socioeconomic or financial status. The main barrier to transplant was that patients were progressing on induction therapy and had a very poor performance status and could not proceed. So our goals for today is to augment your understanding of evidence supporting newer therapeutics as pre-transplant or maintenance strategies in AML, equip you with the skills you need to develop personalized induction, consolidation, conditioning, or maintenance platforms for patients with newly diagnosed or relapsed refractory leukemia, provide you with guidance on dosing, monitoring, and safety consideration when using modern therapeutic platforms in conjunction with transplant and AML. So let's talk about transplant. Let's go back to Robert, 70 year old, presents with pancytopenia and fatigue. Diagnosis of acute leukemia with dysplasia, a trisomy eight, 12 P minus, and a performance status of one. 
He has a molecular studies that show an ASXL1, an SRSF2, a TED2 mutation, and he has definitely confirmed AML MR. A donor is available, and Robert wants to pursue aggressive treatment. So I think you have this conversation every day, Brittany. What is your feeling now about how should we approach this patient? Should we encourage transplant or should we, you know, just let him decide? Yeah, I think we might be similar in our approach. You sort of have to find a reason not to transplant a patient. Um, so I would meet this patient and likely be thinking that a transplant could potentially cure them and he would have to prove me wrong. And I agree with you 100%. So, you know, one of the things that many of us now are challenged in our practices is how do we inform a patient of Robert what his prognosis actually is and what his risks of transplant-related mortality is actually. Uh, so recently, there was a large multi-center study that was performed through the BMTCTN called the Composite Health Risk Assessment Model Study, or the CHARM study. It was comprised of simple and readily available parameters in transplant and oncology clinics. And you can see here the factors that came up was uh, the comorbidity score, the CRP, the albumin, and the weight loss. And this will be eventually a um, calculator that will be available on the web or as an app. But you could divide patients in three categories a low category where the non-relapse mortality risk was 8% in a year, and a high category where the non-relapse mortality rate was 23%. Now, we're going to assume that Robert had a low non-relapse mortality, in which you would definitely encourage him to transplant, because his chances of long-term disease control with this cytogenetics is only possible with a now genetic transplant. However, if his non-relapse mortality rate is high, 23%, then a lot of the conversation with Robert depends on what his priorities are in life. Many of our patients are not scared of dying. They're scared of losing their independence. And depending on what Robert's priorities or values are, he may decide and opt to be a more conservative approach with an induction strategy and then only decide to go to transplant in the event of disease recurrence or the disease or in the events of being primary refractory. So secondary AML, you have, you know, it's, we, we now, the new classifications no longer talk about uh, treatment-related AML. It's AML that has had prior chemotherapy. AML with myelodysplasia, prior myeloid malignancy is considered a much worse uh, actor than patients with de novo AML, as you can see in, in this um, slide. And it's really characterized by specific uh, molecular abnormalities, as Robert has, SRSF2, ASXL1, and the more feared P53 mutation. So what about, how should we take Robert to transplant? So Robert, we know, has what we would call AML-MR, or what would be, you know, secondary AML or treatment-related, we can't say treatment-related AML, he doesn't have a history of treatment, but he definitely had a prior mild dysplastic syndrome. Is there an optimal strategy to induce this patient? So this was the randomized trial of CPX351 that you all know as Vixias versus 7 plus 3 and high Rix AML. These are the five-year results. And as you can see, the um, from the time of randomization, the median overall survival of patients randomized to CPX was nine months versus six months for those randomized to standard seven plus three. More importantly, for those patients who went to transplant, the three-year survival rate for patients who were induced with CPX was 56%, which stays stable at the five-year mark at 52%, significantly better than uh, that seen in patients who being in good enough condition to go into transplant after seven plus three induction still had a significantly better survival. What you can see is the curves drop fairly early, suggesting that patients induced with CPX351 are in better condition as they go to transplant, and they actually have a better disease control. And it has been interesting to see if the MRD status of these patients was actually better if they were induced with CPX versus 7 plus 3, data that is unavailable at this time. 
So what is, as we said, is that it's not only that you have a lower risk of uh, not relapse for, of relapse, as you can see in the curve on the left, but you have a significant decrease of non-relapse mortality. Again, suggesting that recovery from a seven plus three combination, which is you know a um, which is what CPX three five one is in a in a, um, a molar ratio that is predefined versus seven plus three, has a significant improvement in the way a patient comes to transplant which results in a significant reduction in non-relapse mortality and also a significant reduction in uh, a relapse post-transplant with a hazard ratio of 0.72. But we did not achieve statistically significant, but was there definitely suggested. So this is across all subgroups and patients over the age of between 60 and 69 and patients between the age of 70 and 75. So... There's another data set that confirms the prior evidence with CPX351. This is the European real-world evidence. So patients with um, who underwent induction with CPX351, one year over survival was similar across all countries in Europe, 64%, 53%, and 69%. And as seen in other data sets, patients who achieved MRD negativity which was more common with induction with CPX351, had a significantly better outcome than patients who did not achieve MRD negativity. So let's talk about the other induction that we were talking about these uh, for these patients, the non-intense chemotherapy with a combination of venetoclax and a hypomethylating agent, azacitidine. So the long-term follow-up of the, the ILA-A study continues to show a survival benefit of VEN-AZA over AZA alone. So in these patients, a doublet with a BCL2 inhibitor, venetoclax, and a hypomethylating agent, azacitidine, shown a significant benefit. With a medium follow-up of 43 months, the hazard ratio was 0.58. And as you can see here, there is a tail end of the curve that's approximately uh, 18%. So again, in patients with AML MR significant benefit for a venetoclax aza combination versus a single agent azacitidine. And then, so what about now? What do we do with Robert? Should we induce him with venetoclax azacitidine, or should we give him CPX three five one? And again, there's never been we're going to say randomized trial in the situation of a patient like Robert. But we can, with all the caveats, compare across trials. And what it would look like is, is that the overall benefit for taking a patient like Robert to transplant is significant, even whether he's induced with venetoclax azacitidine or whether he gets CPX351. So use of transplant in this patient population is critical for overall survival benefit. And actually, how you did the transplant did not influence overall survival. And the treatment choice did not influence overall survival. So there was a similar early mortality with either option, whether you do venetoclax azacitidine or whether you do CPX351. I have to convince Brittany, I think for Robert, I would still do a venetoclax azacitidine combination. I think it just, it also, it's an easier way to get into transplant. What would you do? I would agree. So the NCCN recommendations on induction options for patients with secondary NML eligible for intensive inductions. These are therapy-related AML other than those who have core binding factor AML. Patients with antecedent MDS, chronic myelomonocytic leukemia. Cytogenic changes consistent with MDS AML with myodysplasia-related changes or AML-MR. As you can see, the NCCN gives us all options, standard 7 plus 3, CPX351, which is a liposomal cytarabine and donorubicin, and the other hypomethylating agents, the cytobine and venetoclax, azacitidine and venetoclax. And of all these, I would say that the two biggest contenders are the aza venetoclax and the uh, CPX351. So let's go back to Robert. What if he did not go to transplant? So now he presents with pancytopenia, fatigue, Gain was diagnosed with AML dysplasia, continues to have a performance status of one, 
He receives uh, his CPX351, 531, does not pursue transplant, relapses and gets venetoclax to cytobine, and now he progresses with 12% blast. And now he has a matcha related donor. Do you tell Robert, look, nothing, you didn't do it in the first time, let's not do this? Or would you encourage transplant for this treatment refractory patient? Again, this is a major challenge that we have in our current clinical practice. So what are the first questions that happens when Robert, you know, presents, particularly when he presents in that initial that we decided to give him the hypomethylating agent? If we already had a donor at that time and we were ready to transplant, should we have even given him salvage chemotherapy? Should we have taken him straight to transplant? So two years ago at ASH, we had this in the plenary session. This was the ASAP trial that was presented by the German cooperative group. Um, and here they asked us specifically that same question. For patients with AML, 18 to 75 years of age, who he had either a poor runs to induction or were untreated relapse and had an HLA-compatible donor, should you try to induce remission by doing RSE mitoxantron and then taking them to transplant? Or should you continue to just watch for weight and control their counts with either low-dose RSC or low-dose mitoxantron, and then when you're ready, take them into transplant with a FLAMSA RIC or a high-dose melphalan flu TBI? And I admit that many of us, when we saw this, we said, this makes no sense. I mean, just these patients are not going to do well if you don't try to reinduce them. But lo and behold, the data showed otherwise. So there were no differences in leukemia-free survival over survival based on the randomization strategy. So it made the, no difference whether patients were randomized to mitosantrin or C, or they were randomized to watch and wait and then transplanted when needed. But we have to, although the conclusions was that patients with poor response after first reduction or relapse AML do not benefit from salvage chemo and should be taken straight to transplant, uh, and patients who you had this expectant or this conservative approach actually spent less time in the hospital, 42 days versus 19 days, and that the impact of morphologic CR at the time of transplant was less important than expected, one has to see that this trial has um, some major issues, which makes it difficult to apply in our current practices. One is that the ASAP trial did not include hypomethylating agents and venetoclaxis salvage, and they were selected to be near and under close monitoring from the transplant program, something that we in the United States have difficult emulating. And although the conclusion was the impact of CR was less than expected, when we've asked the authors, they all recognize that patients who went into transplant in complete remission did significantly better than those patients who did not go into transplant in complete remission. And we don't know really how many patients, what the real denominator was. Although again, when we've asked uh, Matias and Johannes, what they say they really captured more than 90% of the acute leukemia patients entering through the door. So, are there any other strategies coming around that we can use to improve the outcomes with transplant? So we all talked about, we know that radiation therapy is could be a very potent instrument in the control of acute leukemia. The group in Seattle had shown that patients getting high doses of radiation had a lower relapse rate than those getting lower dose, but the expense of a higher non-relapse mortality. Now, targeted radioimmunotherapy allows us to deliver high doses of radiation directly to the tumor. Apavistamab is an anti-CD45 monoclonal antibody conjugated to radioactive iodine. It's designed to deliver targeted myeloblator radiation to hematopoietic cells along with reduced intensity conditioning prior to transplant. It's the first-in-class anti-CD45 antibody conjugated to radioactive iodine to improve transplant outcomes. The Sierra trial, which was reported recently, a couple, uh, almost now uh, a year ago, is the first randomized trial in patients with active, in older patients with active relapse refractory ML, to randomize patients to a IOMAP B uh, induction followed by a reduced intensity conditioning regimen with fludarabine TBI. 
The price, this was con, uh, compared to conventional care, which was a variety of chemotherapy agents. And again, patients with, in the apomistamab arm who achieved a complete remission would be followed for the prescribed primary endpoint, which was durable CR, which is a CR lasting more than six months. And then patients in the conventional care arm could be transplanted or not according to their physician's choice if they were in a complete remission. And again, patients were followed to see if they achieved the primary endpoint. This is the scheme of how abamistamab was administered. There's a dosimetric dose followed by a therapeutic dose with an upper limit of 24 grade to the liver. Median dose delivered was 16 grade to the marrow. And then given the standard reduced intensity condition regimen developed by the Seattle group with fludarabine and low-dose TBI and tacrocyclosporin and mycophenolate mofetil as GVHD prevention. So there was the ability to cross over in patients who were randomized to conventional care. So if patients in conventional care did not achieve a complete remission or relapsed after achieving a complete remission that lasted six months, that less than six months, they could be crossed over to the apomistamab bar. Overall, not going over the sites, there was similar uh, characteristics. I want you to look at the median marrow blast at randomization. 30% for patients randomized to apomistamab and 20% for those randomized to conventional care. These are patients that traditionally would never be taken to transplant because we would think the outcomes of conventional transplant in this patient populations are very bad. So in the crossover arm, 44%, 44 patients, 91% of them received a uh, transplant with 52 of them achieving a CR or a CRP. Six crossover patients achieved CRs that lasted more than six months. Important that post-transplant maintenance was only allowed with FLT3 inhibitors in the apomistamab arm. In the conventional care arms, any type of uh, post-transplant maintenance was allowed. I want to show you the primary endpoints. Durable, achiever, durable complete remission lasting more than six months was 22% versus zero for conventional care. Now you can say, you know, it's 22% is just one out of five, but this is better than zero. And these are the curves. And you can see that, you know, that nobody in the non-crossover arm getting conventional chemotherapy achieved long-term disease control, while about 20% of patients either in the crossover and about 15% of the patients in the IOMFB arm achieve long-term disease control. Moreover, for patients who have durable CRs, these complete remissions continue to ongo, and 60% of the patients who had durable CRs remained in remission at the two-year mark. Apavistamab is very safe with uh, similar uh, episodes of febrile neutropenia compared to conventional chemotherapy, similar uh, mucositis, and importantly, there was no increase in graft-versus-host disease in patients who received apavistamab prior to the fludarabine TBI in the allogeneic transplant. So in conclusion, in the Sierra trial, patients aged over 55 with active relapse refractory ML, apavistamab followed by a RIC with fludarabine and low-dose TBI, enabled allogeneic transplant in a population not typically eligible for transplant. Apamistabap was well tolerated, resulting in engraftment in all treated patients, a high rate of durable CR, and a low rate of serious adverse events. A significant proportion of patients who achieve durable CR with apamistabap are long term survivors. Apamistabap offers a novel solution to increase access to transplant and improve outcomes for patients with relapsed refractory ML. It could be a new standard of care, and we hope that it will uh, be uh, approved. Uh, both in Europe and the United States, so we can offer it to our patients, and more importantly, so we can start exploring apamistamab in other indications and with different combination regimens and donor types. So this is data that was presented here in at ASH. P53 mutated AML is actually one of our biggest challenges. This is the data with apamistamab in patients with TP53 mutated, and currently the median overall survival for patients on Apamistamab with a P53 mutated was 5.4 months versus 1.6 months. But notice that there's a tail end of the curve with two patients now in remission, two and four years. Number of patients are small, but definitely a good signal. And remember, these patients were not allowed to be given any form of maintenance therapy because they were not FLT3 mutated. 
There is not the only uh, new agent that's being considered for conditioning. This is Brachilumab, non-myelablative conditioning. This was also, this is uh, reported in ASH last year. Brachilumab is a monoclonal anti-C-kit antibody that inhibits stem cell factor binding to CD117 or C-kit to replete progenitor cells. And it suggests that it's, it's it, in preclinical studies, it synergizes with low-dose TBI. This is the study looking at Prokilomab followed by a non-myeloblative conditioning in patients with AML. And you can see, you know, these are patients who uh, were in remission. And these, uh, again, small number of patients, but definitely promising and something worthwhile for their exploration. So in summary, in the current era, older patients with AML can be offered transplant as part of an overall management plan. Early referral is key for a successful transplant. Modern treatment strategies have shown the ability to improve outcome in the pre- and peritransplant setting, including higher-risk AML subtypes and for patients with unmet medical needs. And now it's a pleasure to introduce my co-chair, Dr. Brittany Nick Ragon from the Levine Cancer Institute. Thank you. So thank you so much to Peerview and the sponsors for providing the opportunity for me to speak about my life's passion of leukemia and transplant. Um, in full disclosure, I am a leukemia doc and a transplanter, so I take care of patients from diagnosis through treatment, through transplant and beyond. So I think that flavors some of my um, choices in this space. So let's go on to our case. So just as a plug here, in 2023, it was the year of updates in FWIT3 mutated patients when you think about updates in AML, so it is an important topic to be discussing. So our case is Matthew. He's a 57-year-old gentleman with a few weeks of fatigue, shortness of breath, and a headache. He presents to the ED, and he gets a blood count checked. Well, there's 90% peripheral blasts, and he probably has a proliferative white count, so we proceed with a bone marrow biopsy, which confirms acute myeloid leukemia, with neck generation sequencing confirming a FLT3 ITD, DNM T3A, and TET2. He likely has a diploid karyotype. So after talking with Ma Matthew and the team, we decide to pursue an intensive induction with a FLT3 inhibitor. But which FLT3 inhibitor? So now we have an embarrassment of riches. So hopefully I will help to guide this choice for you today. Mitostorin or Quisartinib? And what's the role of gilteritinib? We know it's approved in the relapse refractory space. And if we choose a FLT3 inhibitor, which one will we use in the different phases of care? So what does the NCCN say? For intensive eligible patients with FLT3 ITD or TKD mutations, you have 7 and 3 with mitostorin. It's important to call out that quizartinib plus 7 and 3 is really for FLT3 ITD mutated patients only. So that is now a Category 1 recommendation. Although we're not going to cover patients ineligible for intensive induction in the next few slides, I do want to talk about it briefly here. So currently, the Category 1 recommendation for patients who are not eligible for intensive induction is azacitidine and venetoclax. So no FLT3 inhibitor is included at all in that combination. And it's important to point out that there was a pooled analysis of Viali A in the Phase 1B trial of Azoven that Dr. Konopleva published on, which actually showed that patients who were FLT3 mutated versus FLT3 wild type had no difference in outcomes. Thus, it's appropriate to use Azoven in these patients. I think we were all excited to hear the, up, or the outcome of the lace wing trial with azacitidine and gilteritinib, which was a randomized trial of azagilt versus aza alone. Unfortunately, that trial did not meet its primary endpoint, which is a little bit disappointing but it is an option for patients that have a FLT3 mutation and are ineligible for intensive induction. Of course, I do want to talk briefly about the triplet combination of Azov and Giltritinib. My friend and former co-fellow Nick Short just published on this in JCO, and it showed even with a median follow-up of 19 months, the median overall survival for this phase 1-2 trial had not been reached. So a very promising triplet combination for ineligible patients for intensive induction. So let's go on to our patient and the intensive induction space. So let's talk about Ratify, CalGB10603. So of course, this came out in 2017, led to the approval of mitostorin. So this was looking at 7 and 3 plus mitostorin versus 7 and 3 and placebo. This was um, cytarabine and donorubicin. Patients could get mitostorin with consolidation therapy and could go on to receive 12 cycles of mitostorin maintenance. 
the primary endpoint was overall survival, and of course, that primary endpoint was met. Now, Magistorin is a multi-targeted tyrosine kinase, so it applies to FLT3 ITD mutants and FLT3 TKD mutants. That's important because we know that the more adverse risk patients are the FLT3 ITD mutated patients. Another thing to point out from this study was that 57% of patients went on to transplant. And I think they highlighted this well. Patients who were transplanted and had received mitostorin compared to placebo in the first complete remission actually had an overall survival benefit when mitostorin was included. However, if they transplanted patients outside of first complete remission, that overall survival benefit was no longer, there was no difference in survival, and you can see that patients did worse. So my take home from that is, yes, it helps to use mitostorin in these patients, and they should be considered for transplant and CR1. Of course, this led to the approval of mitostorin and now the inclusion in the NCCN guidelines. And then this brings us to quizartinib. So quizartinib was a trial for newly diagnosed FLT3 ITD mutants because quizartinib is a more selective FLT3 inhibitor. Now, I didn't point out, and I should have, that the RATIFI trial looked at patients from 18 to 59 years old. This is important because the median age on the RATIFI trial was actually 47 years old. In the quantum, they looked at patients from 18 to 75 years old, so an older patient population, and actually 40% of patients were over the age of 60 on the quantum first trial. The median age of patients on this trial was 56 years old, so an older patient population. And this trial also met its primary endpoint of overall survival. So quizartinib was added to 7 and 3. That was citerabine plus donorubicin or idorubicin compared to um, 7 and 3 and placebo. You could get quizartinib with consolidation therapy, and you could go on to receive quizartinib maintenance for up to three years. So transplant was an option on this study as well. Um, and so there was, again, an improvement in overall survival in these patients. And just keep in mind that it was effective for older patients than perhaps the RATIFI trial. So what are the potential side effects of the quizartinib and what's the impact compared to placebo? Well, there certainly is more myelosuppression with the addition of quizartinib, so more neutropenia but this did not translate into more significant febrile neutropenia. Additionally, there was more QT prolongation, which is sort of an expectation of these tyrosine kinase inhibitors at this point, but there was no incidence of torsad. So this led to the FDA approval of quizartinib with intensive induction. Um, and again, if you can't compare trials to each other, but if you actually go back to the ratified trial and you remove the FLT3 TKD mutants, that trial actually does not meet its median overall survival endpoint. So very important to keep that in mind when you're considering which FLT3 inhibitor to include with intensive induction, particularly in patients over 60. So what about additional combinations? So there have currently been four randomized trials with FLT3 inhibitors and intensive induction. You don't really hear about the two negative trials. One of them was a phase two trial of serafinib, which unfortunately did not meet its primary endpoint compared to placebo. However, in that trial, the placebo group had 80% of patients with a co-mutation in MPM1. So perhaps serafinib will have its time in the sun, but currently it's not an option in that space. We have explored gilpseritinib plus chemotherapy, so intensive induction. So Keith Pratt's led this four-part phase one trial um, with patients with newly diagnosed FLT3 mutated AML. It's important to keep in mind that gilpseritinib also can, be treat, can treat patients with FLT3 TKD mutations. So this was a very promising early phase trial that showed that the combination was quite effective. I think there was a median overall survival of 46 months on this study, and it led to additional follow-up studies. So there's a phase two precog 0905 study, which is looking at gilteritinib versus mitostorin with intensive induction. And then there's the phase three Hovon trial, which is looking at the same, um, but that primary endpoint is event-free survival compared to PRECOG 0905, which is an MRD endpoint study. So PRECOG 0905, the schema is here. You can see that we're looking at citerabine, donorubicin, and gilteritinib versus citerabine, donorubicin, and mitostorin. These patients can go on to receive consolidation with these agents and can go on to maintenance as well. 
there's going to be a stratification, and actually this trial has already completed accrual, so I look forward to seeing the outcomes of this study. Um, but there is going to be a stratification based on particular FOOT3 mutation, whether ITD or TKD, MPM1 mutation status, because co-mutation status is very important in interpreting the outcomes of these studies, and also the signal ratio, whether high or low. So that's intensive induction with a FLT3 inhibitor. What about maintenance after transplant? So as I mentioned, on all of those studies, there was a maintenance option for patients. So our patient, Matthew, he decides to go on to transplant, as we discussed before. But he has been noted to have measurable residual disease by a PCR NGS. This brings up a lot of questions. What MRD assessment was used for the patient? What is the role of MRD assessment for choosing maintenance? Let's talk about the MORPHO trial, which I'm very excited to talk about. And are there other options outside of FLT3 inhibitors, such as oral azacitidine? So what does the NCCN say? Well, I'm grateful to the NCCN Guidelines Committee for providing us options, despite them not being Category 1 recommendations. This serves us very well for our patients. Of course, we know in the intermediate and adverse risk patients who have AML and do not go on to stem cell transplant after intensive induction, we do have oral azacitidine approved for those patients. I will say in full disclosure, it is difficult for me to find a patient to put on oral azacitidine because if patients make it through intensive induction and get a complete remission, we're doing our best to get them to transplant. However, it is an option and we love options. What about patients who went on to allogeneic transplant and had a history of a FLT3 ITD mutation? Well, we've got lots of choices, and hopefully I'll be able to guide you in which ones are actually evidence-based choices. Currently, they're all 2B, category 2B recommendations. And then for patients with a history of a FLT3 ITD mutation who no transplant is planned, based on the findings in the Quantum First trial, we have quizartinib as an option for those patients. So let's talk about the MORPHO BMTCTN 1506 study. So I think it's very important because many of us have been using FLT3 inhibitors as maintenance after transplant for some time, using the guidance of the ongoing clinical trials to determine which FLT3 inhibitor to use. But none of those trials were powered to determine the independent effect of FLT3 inhibitor maintenance post-transplant. So it is absolutely critical that we design trials specifically for maintenance after transplant to determine if there's going to be a benefit. So this trial was designed with a primary endpoint of relapse-free survival. Patients had to have achieved um, a remission after one or two inductions, and then just prior to proceeding to allogeneic transplant, they would have a bone marrow aspirate for MRD analysis. And we're going to talk through which MRD was used in this analysis just as a reminder, Ratify and Quantum First used a Leucostrat companion diagnostic, which was actually approved along with Ratify, and that is the same PCR NGS that we're going to be talking about here. So patients had the marrow aspirate. They went on to transplant. They could have any type of transplant you want, any conditioning, any donor, any GBHD prophylaxis. Patients had to have engrafted. They had to be able to take oral medications and not have significant GBHD. And then there is some stratification that was completed on this study, which is mindful, um, knowing the people that would be evaluating this data, looking at the conditioning regimen intensity, time from transplant to randomization, and then measurable residual disease. So patients could receive gilteritinib, 120 milligrams daily as maintenance for up to two years compared to placebo. This was a one-to-one -one randomization. So unfortunately, this study did not meet its primary endpoint. But that's okay, because it was well designed to try to figure out which group of patients benefited most. So as you can see, there was no difference in relapse-free or overall survival, no significant difference in relapse-free or overall survival compared to gilteritinib and placebo. So speaking of measurable residual disease, I think it's important to point out what this test is. So it's a PCR for the FLT3 ITD. So it detects the ITD down to 10 to the minus 4th. And then you have next generation sequencing, which can identify amplicons in the ITD. So this basically gives you a clonal fingerprint for each individual patient and is able to detect multiple FLT3 ITD clones, which we previously 
couldn't in a single patient um, with our prior NGS and flow-based testing. So this can get you a quantitative result down to 10 to the minus 4, and it can get you a detection or a qualitative result down to 10 to the minus 6. So it's an exquisitely sensitive test, which has been very informative for us in treating our patients. So when looking at the measurable residual disease down to 10 to the minus 6 in the MORPHO study, we find the, the population who actually benefited from gilteritinib maintenance. So patients who were MRD positive had a much more improved relapse-free survival compared to placebo. And then patients who were MRD negative, there was no difference in outcomes between those treated with gilteritinib maintenance and placebo. So this is exceedingly important and I think this is what helps me in the clinic space. In full disclosure, I was using gilteritinib maintenance ahead of the study reading out, and it leads to a lot of discussion in patients. And now we're using this in vivo scribe NGS PCR to determine who will best be served by gilteritinib maintenance. So these are the drug-related AEs from gilteritinib versus placebo. There is certainly an appreciable amount of leukopenia and some LFT abnormalities in actual practice. These are very manageable. It does at times lead to dose reductions, but it is very possible and safe to give to patients and tolerable over the time period of two years. There was additional analysis that was done on the MORPHO study since there was this abundance of information about the MRD status of patients. So patients who had greater than or equal to one mutation detected by MRD had a much worse relapse-free survival compared to all other patients. So patients with multiple clones did worse. That's important to keep in mind. Now, patients who had a clone and went on to transplant, they actually were able to eradicate that clone with transplant alone and placebo in about 44% of patients. So there is some potential graft versus leukemia effect in this population. However, in the patients who received gilteritinib, they were able to eradicate their clones in 69% of patients. So there is an augmentation with gilteritinib along with transplant that is seen when gilteritinib maintenance is used. So what are the take-home points? Well, MRD-positive patients, in my opinion, based on this data, absolutely benefit from gilteritinib maintenance in the post-transplant setting. And I think that aligns with where we felt patients were getting benefit because we were certainly seeing a reduction in relapse for patients who were receiving FOOT3 inhibitor maintenance post-transplant. The problem was we were previously applying it to all patients when it really only benefits a select few. So patients should only be considered MRD negative if you're using the right test. So I encourage everyone to utilize the NGS-PCR testing. I believe that it's extremely informative and really will transform the landscape of foot 3 mutated care. In non-transplant patients, there was survival benefit for the use of maintenance regardless of MRD status. So what would the role be of maintenance if transplant is not pursued? Well, we had obvious survival benefit from quizartinib compared to placebo, even if patients weren't transplanted. But again, just keep in mind that patients did better when they were transplanted. So there is FDA approval as maintenance monotherapy for consolid following consolidation for foot 3 itd mutated AML. However, it is not indicated as maintenance therapy following transplant because, again, these were not powered to determine the independent effect of maintenance therapies. And then we have Quasar. So this is the oral azacitidine versus placebo randomized trial that showed that there is a benefit in all patients who received oral azacitidine compared to placebo and this is a potential option for patients, even the foot 3 mutated, which we'll talk about here in a second. Now, there's also vialli m which is testing venetoclax in combination with oral azacitidine as maintenance therapy. But keep in mind, this is an intensive induction-treated population, so it's not meant to serve the HMA then that get into remission as a maintenance option. So in Quasar, there was an analysis done on the foot 3 mutated patients who received oral azacitidine compared to placebo. And there was a benefit in the foot 3 mutated population. So again, it is an option that you could utilize, but I think preferentially the foot 3 inhibitors um, would be preferred. If for whatever reason you cannot tolerate foot 3 inhibitors or some other indication, you might consider oral azacitidine in these patients. And keep in mind when interpreting these studies, there was a reasonable amount of co-mutations in MPM1 
mutated patients, and there were many foot three TKDs. So other developments with maintenance therapy post-transplant, such as HMA and venetoclax, let's talk about it. So earlier attempts at post-transplant maintenance were not as promising as we would have hoped. Um, so there was a study of azacitidine maintenance following transplant. It was a randomized study. Um, there were some challenges with the study. In fact, getting patients on azacitidine maintenance was a great challenge. And then the median cycle of azacitidine was intended to be up to a year, but the median number of cycles was just four. So this did not meet its primary endpoints. There was no difference in overall survival. So many of us sort of abandoned the idea of foot three maintenance for a while. So this study was published in 2020, but there was actually a 2018 study that Sergio was a part of looking at oral azacitidine maintenance. And this was in a small number of patients. It was an early phase trial, but it showed very promising results of tolerance um, and um, improved relapse-free survival in patients. So there is an there's going to, or there is a phase three trial, the Amadeus trial, which is looking at oral azacitidine maintenance following transplant. This trial is going to complete accrual in 2024, and I look forward to seeing this. This is for high-risk patients with AML. We certainly need something for these patients. This was a small study done at 20 patients with high-risk AML and MDS, looking at low-dose decitabine plus venetoclax. And this actually was very promising with um, a really great two-year relapse-free and overall survival. And so that leads us to VIL-AT, which is looking at venetoclax and azacitidine. This is a two-part study, a maintenance trial after, um, for patients post-transplant with AML. And this is particularly important for patients like TP53 mutated patients who might get to transplant. We really feel like they need some type of maintenance and azaven feels like the right thing. So the first portion of this study is complete. They have the max tolerated dose, and they are currently enrolling up to 400 patients in the phase three study of BESTS. So there's a, a couple of you have asked, what is the role of seven plus three in today's world of uh, HMA and venetoclax and the experience taking patients to transplant after induction with low intensity treatments? And actually the MD Anderson wrote a paper looking at Veneza versus uh, seven plus three going to transplant. And the outcomes are similar to what we saw uh, with CPX versus 7 plus 3, that patients um, who received the less intense regimen had less toxicity, but there was a slightly higher risk of relapse. So that brought them into, uh, you know, at the end of the day, the survivals were similar. Uh, well, you know, so, I mean, this question about what is the role of 7 plus 3 in, in the world of HMA venetoclax, what are, what are you thinking? So, um my bias is showing I, I really, we were an HMA heavy place for a long time. And so that's why we're participating in the induction trial, trying to move HMA then into the younger patient population. So it's going to be interesting. I think seven and three has a role for particular populations of AML, but it may not be the built for everyone. There are also a couple of questions looking at, you know, how do we, how do we assess the risk of older patients? And I mean, the one thing is age is just a number, and I do think we are now working very closely with our geriatricians, and we're using the different geriatric assessment scores, primarily to be able to inform patients what the risk of non-relapse mortality is, and to be able to help them inform them about whether they want to proceed to transplant or not. Um, but I don't. I think at this time, age, performance status, and geriatric assessments become the biggest. Uh, uh, the biggest factors. I'm always asked, is there an upper limit of normal? Most of these patients vote with their feet. So I can tell you, I've seen only maybe a handful of 80 year olds in the last five years, but the same number of 70 year olds that are coming to transplant is increasing dramatically. And 60 and 65 year olds are now, it's a new 40. And that's because I'm 65. <laughs> <laughs> I have a few questions here Sorry. as well. So, how often and when do you check MRD post-transplant to decide on maintenance skill tritinib? I think that's a great question. Um, I certainly encourage getting that bone marrow biopsy right before you're going into transplant, as the Morpho trial did, so that you have an a, a assessment of the MRD status heading into transplant. And then I actually check at at least day 100 and then would check at the day one year marrow. Of course, there's not a ton of guidance in that space, but I think it's important to remember that the Morpho trial saw eradication of clones over time. So if you have an MRD positive patient, that might compel you to check more often 
If you have an MRD negative patient, I still think it's important to check over time um, to ensure that a clone hasn't risen. So I think the last series of questions we're going to answer before we adjourn is the issue of apivistamab. So apivistamab is not cur currently commercially available. Um, TMLI, which is available in some centers, has been used. We have, they've never been compared head to head. As I've said, you know, what do you do with a patient who has 5 to 10% blasts? I think this patient should go to transplant in a clinical trial, looking at these new novel strategies for either maintenance or, uh, or conditioning. And finally, the last question, how are you addressing delayed count recovery with CPX? If we can take that, if that patient's ready to transplant, we do not wait for count recovery. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash AJC860. This activity is supported by independent educational grants from Actinium Pharmaceuticals, Astellas, and Jazz Pharmaceuticals, Incorporated.